Aloha, and welcome back to the Creative Life Show from the American Creativity Association's Austin Global Chapter. I'm your host, Phyllis Bleese. Joining me today from Vancouver, Canada, is Dr. Haley Simons. She has received international acclaim for her talent as a concert pianist, for her travel around the world with her musical talent, and she has achieved a doctorate of music and certifications as a life coach and arbitrator. What brings her here today is her long-standing and deep dive into the world of creativity. She co-founded Creative Alberta, and she coaches people on accessing their own creative code. Her first show with us at The Creative Life was on the topic of protecting what she terms the prodigal creative, that creative spirit that we believe resides in all of us. In today's show, Haley draws more directly on her career as a concert pianist for her lessons learned on how to resurrect our inner creative. And the title of today's show is The Beethoven Betrayal. More about that soon. Let's meet Dr. Haley Simons. Aloha, Haley. Aloha, Phyllis. Well, we're very happy to have you back. And I want you to talk, please, a little bit about that. We touched on your journey as a prodigal creative and how we'd like to know how this relates to where we are today in the development of the Beethoven betrayal and how to resurrect our inner creative spirit. Right. Well, thank you for having me back. This is, um, uh, of course, my favorite topic to talk about is creativity and to maybe give a bit of the backstory. It's almost like a prequel to our first conversation. Where did all of this come from and where did this um, yearning to explore this this subject of creativity and that path that we talked about the first time. And uh, it, I thought it would be a little um, insightful maybe to look at where it all began and my training as a, as a pianist uh, for decades. And um, from very, very early on, I think I started playing piano when I was about three years old. So it does actually have an origin story. I guess you could say this is the origin story. Well, and I've had several people follow up from that show, and they want to know all about how do you become a concert pianist? So we'd love to revisit this. This is not usual, and uh, you invite us into a very special life. So please, how would you like to do this? Well, there is a recording that we have um, dragged from the past, and uh, it is a, a recording. It's probably one of the first uh, classical music videos back in the day when MTV was was all the rage. When music videos were just starting out, there were weren't any or very few classical music videos, and we wanted to take. Uh, the, a really standard, wonderful classical piece and make it accessible visually for people, uh, for um, contemporary audiences. So this recording is actually an etude of Chopin and uh, it's known by its popular title of Winter Wind. And we're gonna watch it next? We're gonna watch it next. Okay.
Thank you, Haley. That was very profound to me to have you sitting here and having produced that level of classical music. Um, bring, bring us now full circle into what this did for you to shift you into becoming a coach for the, our own creative code. Well, it, it's always awkward watching your own videos. Um, the, the process getting to that point, I mean, uh, of course, was the, the result of years of studying with, with real masters, real um, musical geniuses. I was privileged, really astoundingly, um, humblingly privileged to work with all those years. And um, the, the common thread uh, for, for myself and, and all musicians working toward that level of, of, of artistic expression is a, a combination of um, inspiration and discipline. We talked about this uh, briefly um, in preparation for this. And uh, watching that video, actually, in hindsight, it brought up a lot of uh, past memories and, and uh, homages I wanted to, to pay to the people who were involved in that. Um, actually, the producer of that video, which I thought was very creatively done, all the candles and the uh, the the process of of recording that, um, I thought was an amazingly creative venture. And the producer who was in charge of that, uh, Michael Ham, recently passed. He um, was an Edmonton filmmaker, very talented, and was saddened to to hear of his passing. Um, because there were a lot of creative minds and hearts and and a lot of inspiration went into a recording like that, not just the performance aspect. And and for myself, I brought my own um, craft. Everyone brought their craft. And it really gets me thinking about the the discipline that's involved in all of this creative talk. And sometimes we we get to that point where we're talking about creativity as though it's a it's a playful little whim uh, that we want to we want to nourish and and we want to to have flourishing in our lives as something enjoyable. But but the flip side of that is creativity is actually uh, a discipline. It's a tool that we work on perfecting, and it's uh, for any artist. I'm speaking not just from for myself. I know it's it's almost like an oath of craftsmanship. When I had the privilege of working with these, these masters like, like John Perry, who is, is still teaching at the age of 88, he's still teaching in, in New York and throughout, throughout the world. And this artistry doesn't retire. It keeps going and going. And even if the actual physical part, the physical component of performing and preparing for concerts. Um, I've, I've not done that for a while, um, but the creative spirit keeps going. And um, we were going to talk about, uh, this brings into, into play the title of our, our show's topic today, The Beethoven Betrayal. And I, I know we just heard Chopin, but I, um, I, Routinely performed the the standard classical composers that everybody would know Beethoven and Chopin and Rachmaninoff and and all of those pieces because I loved playing those pieces and people I thought loved hearing those pieces um, always no matter how frequently they were played there's always something in a piece of music like that that is either very awe-inspiring or, or very moving. Hopefully, that, that's the goal of a performance and working up to that, that kind of um, state on, from all avenues. And the, um, the, there was, <laughs> I'll take you back a, a little story. About the time when this was recorded, uh, I was also a performer in a contemporary ensemble called uh, the Hammerhead Consort. We were an ensemble of two pianos, two percussionists. We were a very oddball group and we toured um, 
performing pieces that were written by contemporary, meaning living composers. There was <laughs> one composer that we had who was uh, no longer with us, and that was Bartok. And he made that particular grouping. Um, uh, and he was the the originator of the two piano, two percussion model. And I thought it would be interesting because I had always channeled these voices of the past, whether it's Chopin or Beethoven. I wanted to get to the level of, of competency where I could um, authentically or feel like I was bringing their voice to life today. So I was a conduit. I was just channeling. And... I thought it would be interesting to explore the mind of the composer and what was Beethoven thinking? What was his everyday life? And this um, performance ensemble gave me the opportunity to do that because we worked only with living composers. We were, our group was responsible for the commissioning of, of over 40 works um, by 40 living composers. Hopefully um, uh, they'll, they'll live in, in perpetuity today. Some, it, it, it was like having a, a, a slice of what was happening in, in musical centuries uh, in the past. And it'll be interesting to see what actually survives this test of time. One of those composers, while I was in the midst of prep, preparation for another recording, um, which included a Beethoven sonata and this Chopin that, that we just heard, asked me, well, how many times do we really need to hear another Beethoven sonata? And I didn't have a reply. Well, actually, at the time, I replied, hopefully at least one, because I was working on it. But I didn't have a reply. And in hindsight, I can see that was the pivotal moment which set into motion this, what turned out to be this existential crisis. Well, maybe as a conduit or as a channeler of these voices, my role was actually very, uh, almost insignificant. And was I really creative? I mean, all musicians and artists like to think of themselves. I like to I used to like to think of myself as as creative, and that was challenging on such a heartfelt level. I didn't know if I played a role anymore. I was just the recording device, essentially, and it threw me off for a long time. It made me really examine what is the purpose of of music and performance and um, creation and creating music and what went into that. I was no composer. I hadn't created anything. I was just the, the instrument. I was the tool. I was the technology behind it. And of course, these days we have this, this AI, this artificial intelligence, this new technology that can play anything. So what was my role? Was it really significant? Well, what was your answer? <laughs> And and how many years did it take? I mean, it sounds to me like that was probably a troublesome, but um, uh, not uh, not real question that you had for yourself. That you knew you were creative, but you weren't demonstrating it and practicing. Pra you know, you started out this whole show saying that creativity is sort of a combination of creativity and discipline and you so is it a rhetorical question for yourself to say have I lost my creative spirit has it disappeared do I now we're talking about the the show reclaiming the creative spirit today did you feel like it got lost uh silenced in the discipline part and overshadowed because you weren't using your own you know, you were your your metric was you're playing someone else's music, and is that a fair metric? Um, and how does someone else's music differ from the fact that music touches a creative spark in us that that alchemically becomes something new because we're hearing it, and we're either playing it or dancing it or listening to it or and and just receiving it. 
all of that seems to me there's alchemy in there that brings the human being into the music and the music into the human being. So I've thrown some things. It felt like it was a rhetorical question, but you said you were having an existential crisis around it. And so play with oh, some of those themes, if you would, um, to, to help us reclaim our own creative spirit. Mm-hmm. I I love that word, Phyllis, when, when you said it's alchemy. It is. It, it's literally alchemy. I don't think I recognized that at the time. I didn't really recognize that there was an actual energetic exchange. And the metric that you spoke of, actually in the classical field, became um, not just not just that metric, but you had to perform the best. And it was very competitive. Perfectionism was pervasive and uh, ultimately really destructive. It it overshadowed the the beauty of that uh, alchemy, that exchange that that was the high for me, and and the the origin of all of it, and the the existential crisis became um, a, a little less ego involved i have to admit i mean my ego was was damaged it was bruised a lot with that one comment and the taking a few steps back and of course as as our last show talked about it i took some steps back and sideways and a few leaps here and there as well <laughs> but when it comes down to it it's it's that question of of well what is our purpose do we actually uh, collectively know and, and individually, do we know our sense of purpose? Are we really tuned in or are we out of tune? Like I was, I, the dissonance I felt was, was extraordinary. And then when I segued into my new chapter, my new career that we spoke of last time, including working in the legal field, um, that dissonance became deafening. And so it morphed into this, um, uh, re- it's it's like a reflective process. One of the, the most impactful moments I had, whether it was teaching or performing, and I was teaching concurrently, um, was always about that alchemy, that exchange of energy, that that communication, that connection with somebody else, with another living, breathing human being. If you can connect and impact with someone, I thought that's. Uh, that's the real creativity. That's our role. And that's when everything took this pivot to where I am today. You know, there's so much uh, invested in what you have just shared with us. I mean, including your performance, top of your game, concert pianist. Uh, There are other videos that viewers could find of you where you're, you're center stage with an entire symphonic orchestra and what one of those embedded ideas that come up for me is this this gap between being so perfect that you channel almost as though you were the that other original artist and when we fall short is that are the are those the shadow sides of all of that work is that where suicide comes in I think of Vincent Van Gogh and being out in the in the sunflower fields and shooting himself when he has had some of his his most productive two or three years of painting. Like the, the, 60, 70 percent of all of his art happened in a, maybe a three year period of his life, three to five years of his life. And he dies in his 30s. And the, it, but he shot himself. And you talked last time in the legal profession we have we have judges who are outside of ourselves evaluating the quality of our work, whether it be as a lawyer, your client, whether you win or lose, or whether it's a senior partner, uh, or whether the judge gives you a hard time. And you, if you feel that you haven't lived up to that, their definition of what is it? Is it perfection? Is it creativity? Do we lose our soul to that, to the point where we want to lose our life? And so you're you're really calling last time for the prodigal creator to come out for us to to revivify what the connection is to our 
creative juices and you were right there on stage. I mean, could you have um, spiraled down to where you were alcoholic or doing drugs? I mean, our artists go that way. And in the, I don't know that we'll cover it all today. I want to. You're the very one who could speak to the the angst of the creative spirit uh, being so stellar and falling so short of that in your own in your own estimation that we go into drugs, suicide, self destruction. So I, I think it, how do we re, how do we not do that? that so many layers there so so big a question um my my question that that arose out of that you know, certainly there are there are depths of despair when when you feel the depths of of joy and you experience the depth of beauty and that that taste of being able to the the immense power the rush to that you feel communicating and being able to to hold an entire audience captive that's that's like the power of mass communication we're doing that through the creativity um to to have that cut off mm -hmm. i think can bring on this despair mm -hmm. and even without having that pinnacle of artistic performance, if our creative essence is cut off or stifled in any way, I think the the opportunity for despair is is ripe, and we become subject to um, this this judging, this metric. I mean, we all have this metric, this self doubt, this voice uh, that can be completely debilitating at times. What happens if you take that self-doubt and you couple that with what's the point and that's the ultimate arrival to to that despair that that uh you know maybe we feel um occasionally but if we feel it for an extended period of time that's when it becomes really really damaging and and potentially fatally damaging and we saw that even with um our examination of those in the legal profession who have such enormously high standards and high pressure and stresses on them and talk about a real life judge situation when you are judged constantly and you feel that that dissonance well what what's the point if you haven't even gotten in touch with your your creative self or your essence, which is the point, and that would be what I underscore the entire time, is our creative essence is the point. That's why we're here on this planet, to connect with other people. And anything we do can be an oath of craftsmanship, like I experienced as an artist, or you can experience as a lawyer, you can experience as a film producer. That oath of craftsmanship to what we do is our own homage to creativity. And I wanted to bring in something that we didn't get a chance to, to talk about last time. And I think I wore this last time as well. I wear this little um, trinket, this little necklace. And what it is, it's encased in silver, but it's actually a, a malakate. And a malakate was a spinning whorl. It was used as a tool by a teenage girl in the 15th century in Aztec. And this was her communication device with everyone. Oh. And I wear oh. that to, to remind us. I love that, that world, the spiral, and that, that, that we aren't on a straight line, but that we're spiraling in and out of being in tune with our creative spirit. Well, we don't have enough time. We clearly need more time with you just to develop, first of all, the strength of this conversation takes us some time. So we'd love to have you back, Haley, but we'll have to leave it there for now. And I want to let the audience know that you've been watching The Creative Life from the American Creativity Association's Austin Global Chapter on Think Tech Hawaii. And today we've been talking with our guest, Dr. Haley Simons to learn about the Beethoven betrayal and how to resurrect our inner creative. Mahalo, Haley. 
for joining us and mahalo to our viewers for tuning in. I'm Phyllis Bleas, and we will be back in two weeks for another edition of The Creative Life. Aloha.